Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those whom the Lord pardons for sin and whose spirit is clean from all falsehood. When I said, I will confess my sin to the Lord, you forgave the guilt of my sin. Celebrate and rejoice because those who were lost have been found and restored. This is Disciples Net. We thank you for coming. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. May we join together as we come before God in a spirit of prayer. Most gracious and loving God, gather us in. Quiet the busyness of our minds and draw us ever close to you. Fill us with your spirit of love and grace. We are grateful for the gift of life and the love of one another. Your presence is often felt through the hug of a friend, the touch of a hand, 
the laughter of friends, and in tenderness that goes beyond words. It is with these acts of love that we begin to understand your abiding friendship. We come, afraid for this world's well-being, praying for peace, even as we confess that it is difficult, sometimes even impossible, to live peacefully within our families and neighborhoods. But in the midst of conflict, we know it is you who turn our minds to thoughts of peace. Your spirit changes our hearts. Enemies begin to speak to one another. And those who have been separated join hands in friendship and nations seek the way of peace together. We lift before you, God, all those who are suffering from illness or grieving the loss of loved ones. Surround them with your gentle and loving care. With heavy hearts, we pray for all those impacted by violence in our world. Ease their pain as they journey through the next days and weeks. Comfort those who have been injured, heal their bodies and renew their spirits with your love. Hear the prayers of all your people. We are grateful, God, for being your children. Remind us to slow down, to breathe, and to hear your still voice. May we be people with gentle hearts whose every beginning and every ending is found in you. Be with us as we pray together. Our Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven. hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Our scripture today is from 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verses 11 through 21. This concerns the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others. But we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God for God's people. Thanks be to God.
One of the most exciting things about the Bible to me is that the more I read it and reread it, the more I see different facets of a scripture passage I didn't see the last time. And so it dawned on me as I was reading our passage today from 2 Corinthians on reconciliation that if Paul and Timothy are urging the church to be reconciled to God and to one another, this means there's been a break in those relationships. There's a break in Christian unity. And Paul and Timothy see this unity as sin. And it's something that we all must constantly be working on in each of our communities. Barton Stone said, Christian unity is our polar star. He was a minister and one of the founders of the Disciples of Christ, who focused on God's love and Christian unity. So, what happens when we lose sight of our polar star? What happens when Christian unity breaks down? What happens after conflict erupts in the church? Paul and Timothy address that in today's passage. But first, let's get a little background on the letter. 2 Corinthians, just like the rest of the New Testament, was written to the church, for the church, by the church. Paul and Timothy wrote this letter as the opening line states, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, including the saints throughout Achaia. Achaia is the southern region in Greece where Corinth is located, and Corinth was a busy, big cosmopolitan city. Generally speaking, 2 Corinthians is Paul and Timothy's outreach to this conflicted church. They urge the church to restore, to reconnect, and reconcile. The person causing conflict in the community that Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians, he's repented. And now Paul and Timothy urge the church to reconnect him to the community. And there are some in the Corinth church who still question Paul's authority as an apostle. And so the rest of the letter is working with that. But in the theme of reconciliation here in the last part of chapter 5, Paul and Timothy seek to reunite the Corinthian church, and they want the church and us to do two things. First, be reconciled to God. If Paul and Timothy are telling the Corinthians to be reconciled to God, it means their relationship with God is impaired. The conflict within the church has broken the unity of the church, and this hurts and sickens the body of Christ. But what does it mean to be reconciled to God? It's something I've been struggling with to define as I've prepared the sermon, but there's not a lot of clarity. It means to be made whole again, to be brought together again, to be restored, to be reunited to God. Interestingly, instead of the term be reconciled, other Bible translations have the idea here of being friends with God, or having peace, or forgiveness with God. And while Paul is writing in the plural, urging the church to be reconciled to God, reconciliation is also a heart issue. So it's both communal and personal. It's communal because the Christian church is a collective community. Because we're reconciled to God in Christ, we are to be reconciled with others. It is our relationships expressed in love for one another that show the whole world that not only are we followers of Jesus, but it also shows the world that God sent Jesus. In John's Gospel, Jesus prayed to God that they, meaning we, would be completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And in the same Gospel, Jesus tells his disciples, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 
And reconciliation is also personal. Each one of us are part of the church. And so in light of personal reconciliation with God in Christ, we each choose or choose not to reconcile with others. The second thing Paul and Timothy urge the church and us to do is to have one focus. Paul and Timothy also urged the Corinthians to have this one uniting focus, Jesus Christ. Christ is our everything. The love of Christ controls us, they say. When we focus on someone or something other than Christ, the Christian church and our mission suffers for it. If our focus is Christ, we are not only united and reconciled to God, but we can be and we are united with one another. And that extends the mission of reconciliation. As Paul wrote, Christ died for all so that all who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Christ who died and was raised for them. 2 Corinthians was written to a specific congregation 2,000 plus years ago. Paul and Timothy also have a word for us. The church today is not very united. Not just our local congregations, but globally as well. In my part of the world, the United States, Christians are divided right now over our national presidential campaign. Some Christians are for one party, some Christians are for another party, and both treat the other as an enemy. And it divides the church in America. We let sin, politics, greed, and selfishness divide us. Now, I, I don't know. Maybe that's happening in your part of the world, too. But the bottom line is that we all need to be reconciled to God and to one another. We need to repent of our division and reconcile. What's the gospel? What's the good news right here in this text today? Well, let me remind you. In union with Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to God's very self. We are reconnected, we are restored, and we are renewed. We are the church. As Paul wrote, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Paul goes on to say, this is God doing all of this. In reconciling the world to God's self, God is no longer counting our trespasses against us. God has liberated us from our trespasses. We are free to live for Christ and for one another. As new creations, we no longer live for ourselves. Paul urges us in verse 15 to no longer live for ourselves, but for Christ, just like he did in Romans 15 and in Philippians 2. And in living for Christ, it also means we can live our lives for and with other Christians in the community and in the churches around the world. And so we live for Christ, living the message and teachings of Jesus so much that we live as ambassadors for Christ. Living for Christ and following His ways in such a way that when we speak and act, it is as if Christ himself is speaking. And now, not only Paul and Timothy are entrusted with Christ's ministry of reconciliation, but so are we. We all get to entreat others on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God, to be in Christ, to be made whole again, where brokenness becomes wholeness. A key part of reconciliation is that despite conflict, the Corinthians and Paul and Timothy kept the conversation going. They kept talking. They maintained their relationship. They didn't write each other off. They didn't tune each other out. They kept the dialogue going. 
And may we do the same. May we remember that the church is a collective community of new creations reconciled to God in Christ. As we move into our time of prayer and communion, I want to leave us with a question. Are we living as the new creation that we really are? What's stopping us? What holds us back from that? I mean, Paul wrote that the past, the old, is gone, and behold, the new has come. Let's live into the newness and the freedom and the unity we have in Jesus Christ. And for those who are watching who aren't Christians, the love of God urges me to invite you today to be reconciled to God too, to become a follower of Jesus Christ. So contact us with the information that's at the bottom of the screen. And let's start that journey today. Very early in my life, when I was just a kid, I became a fan of the kind of joke, the kind of humor that is the pun, a play on words, where words are twisted in a way that they mean something a little different than they were intended to mean, and people find it funny. There is an interesting pun, which is not exactly funny, but interesting that comes to my mind today as we come to this table. When we focus on what it means to be torn apart and to be at odds with one another and to be brought back together, to be reconciled, I am reminded of the language that is not certainly on this table, but so many communion tables and so many sanctuaries have the phrase, in remembrance of me. And Jesus invites us to remember him. But then I once heard someone meditate on the word remembrance and separate it into remembrance, meaning putting the members of something back together, something that has been torn apart, that has been dismembered, remember. And we are invited to come to this table in remembrance of Jesus. When we as Christians separate, argue, fight with one another, it is like tearing apart the body of Christ. And we are invited to come here today to put the body of Christ back together, to remember. And it is a great irony that we put together the body of Christ by sharing a ritual act where we actually tear apart a piece of bread, which represents tearing apart Christ's body. It is an interesting play on words, if you will. But I invite us all today to come to this table in a spirit of remembering, remembering our own body, our body of Christ and remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, help us as we come to this table today to understand what it means to truly be your children, to be brothers and sisters with all Christians, in fact, all of your children everywhere. 
Help us come to the table, not only to you, but help us come to the table toward each other and together with each other. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All is in readiness. Come now to this glorious feast. Friends, may the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit reconcile you to God and to one another. Amen.